This is Rob Johnson, president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Mike Spence, Nobel laureate from 2001, and the co-chair of the Commission on Global Economic Transformation at INET, a professor at many different places based in Milan, Italy, and a uh, tremendous, tremendous partner and ally in opening the world's eyes to technology, China, and many other things. Mike, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Rob. It's good to be with you. So we've got, as I said to you moments ago, Jerry Lee Lewis, whole lot of shaking going on. We got pandemics, we got climate change, we got nervous people, we got feelings about how technology affects democracy. Yep. I'm, I'll always like to start with the with the whiteboard <laughs> where you can paint right. the picture. What do you see, Mike? What's what's right now at the at the top of your concerns? Well, you know, I mean, I, I always like to, Rob, to start with things that we can be fairly sure of without being overconfident about. So we know we were in a digital transformation, you know, for some time now. We know we experienced a, an acceleration in terms of its scope and to some extent its pace as a result of breakthroughs in uh in uh, computing power, artificial intelligence, learning algorithms, and so on. And then we got the pandemic. And so now I think, you know, if we're sort of stay on the same track, we can be pretty sure that this transformation that we were involved in is going to proceed at an accelerated pace. Uh, mm -hmm. Not just because it, of the forced acceleration in the pandemics, but more looking at slightly longer term, but because the the forced acceleration in the pandemic also produced uh, accelerated adoption, which carries with it, you know, experiments that wouldn't have been conducted, discoveries about how to use the technology that it wouldn't have occurred at the same rate. They would have occurred, but they wouldn't have occurred at the same rate. And you can see that happening all over the place. You can see it in healthcare, you know, including primary care. Uh, you can see it in what they're calling telehealth. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it just would have taken, not ages, but a long time before the medical profession and their and their patients got around to thinking that you really didn't have to go to the emergency room or the office or the or the, you know, healthcare provider every time you needed to have a chat with uh, some of the medical staff. Um, you can see it in education. Uh, mm -hmm. educational institutions were forced to adopt, they'll revert to some extent because, you know, frankly, online is awfully useful, especially when offline is prohibited or, or uh, dangerous, but it's not a substitute for in-person. On the other hand, it is a complement mm -hmm. to in-person mm -hmm. learning. And so what we learn by be being forced to use the technology, and, and education is another sphere where adoption for a variety of reasons tends to be slow. These two sectors are not unique, by the way. And so mm -hmm. I see that coming. Now, that, that, so that, that seems pretty easy. Um, but we know then there's this host of challenges that you and I have talked about and opportunities um, that, that, that we've got to contend with. Uh, and the list is so long. I mean, we could use up, you know, the next day and a half talking about it. I think I think one of them, at least in the developed countries, is is dealing with the transitions in work, the skills required, and so on. And I think this is a little idiosyncratic and not not totally aligned with the way I think the majority of the writing uh, runs in this dimension. This is usually perceived as either a big problem because we're not going to be able to employ people, but that's not the majority view. The majority view is that we need to to facilitate and help people make fairly large changes in the skill set they bring to the marketplace, at, you know, through programs, through engagement from companies, through edu shifts in the educational system, etc. And I think that's basically right. And there's a lot of very good people in government, in the nonprofit sector, and in business working on it, frequently in partnership. So I don't think mm -hmm. it's going to be pretty. And I think it's going to be harder because of this acceleration we just talked about, but we're moving in the right direction. I think the real, you know, crack in the foundation 
of this is the very, at least in the United States, is the very high level of inequality. You know, so people don't have buffers that help them make these transitions. That inequality and the, those buffers declined and got worse. I mean, the inequality increased and the buffers declined in the mm -hmm. pandemic economy, mm -hmm. even though the governments, the government has tried um, to buffer that shock. And this, and, and, and in fairness, that was true even in the previous administration, at least That's to right. some extent. Mm -hmm. um, but you can't buffer it completely. But the going in, stat, you know, initial conditions were very high levels of income and wealth inequality, and that just makes this transition, you know, scarier for people and harder to get done. You know, if mm -hmm. people, if we had built out institutions that had effectively dealt with managing inclusive growth, you know, and this has been talked about a lot by us, by lots of people, then we could deploy those institutions uh, or adapt them. Uh, and when we would have households sitting there with more resources to invest in their future than we do now. So I, to me, the, the underlying, the big underlying challenge, I'm, I don't mean to minimize the the transition in work. But the big underlying challenge, I think, is to deal as rapidly and effectively as we can with the income and wealth inequality using multiple instruments, you know, social services, high quality, free, you know, expanding those to help people in this particular set of challenges, mm -hmm. uh, tax system. And even then, you know, it, it, reversing the the trends in wealth inequality is going to be a Herculean challenge because, as you and I have discussed, I mean, the wealth is held in a highly concentrated fashion. The investment opportunities at the upper end are much larger. Uh, at the upper end of that spectrum are much larger and much higher return. Just think about it. You know, people mm -hmm. with little skinny little balance sheets are, you know, investing in stocks where they may or may not do well. They would have done well if they stuck with it in the, in the recent past or bonds where they're not going to, you know, get much of a return at all um, unless they're traders. And, they, you know, the, the average person can't trade effectively in these markets and generate return that way. Uh, and then and then you start to get into things where the returns really are quite impressive. But those are the ones where that require a liquidity, a lot of them. Uh, and that's just not accessible to these people. So I think there's, uh, and then it's turbocharged by, you know, the Jim Basile effect, um, you know, which is the intangible assets are being created and, and dominate now the, the value creation in the public markets. Um, and they're being created by relatively small numbers of people. And those assets are owned by small numbers of people. Um, and those are all very powerful trends that, um, are running in, in, in a different direction. So I think in addition to the, so we need a, a multidimensional assault, I guess, you know, with government leading the charge, uh, mm -hmm. but with engagement from basically the rest of us um, to kind of deal with this. And I think we're going to have to deal with wealth, investment opportunities, post-tax income, and, and, uh, and public service delivery kind of all at once and, yeah. and, and to get to get the job done. And where some people, uh, even progressives, are quite cynical about this mm -hmm. is that they see the role of money in politics creating a situation where as the wealth concentration increases, governance serves fewer and fewer people. And uh, things like what used to be called tax evasion is now tax avoidance. And people are allowed <laughs> to keep their point. money yeah. legally offshore and then yeah. say we can't afford it back home to build out the infrastructure, the health systems and what have you. And so there's a, uh, a cynicism that really accelerated during the time of the great financial crisis where Absolutely. people really feel like government is captured. And that, I think, you, you and I could go through a whole menu of sectors where things are being exacerbated or difficult. And through that whole menu, there is a common thread, which is the role of money in politics and large-scale money in politics 
has been uh, allowed to commodify social design. And I think that's Yeah, no, very... I couldn't agree with that more. I mean, I think, you know, I like, I like to try to simplify things. So uh, I agree with everything you said. I, I think, you know, we somehow uh, with leadership or, you know, fighting the political battles, we have to get to a point where money isn't the decisive factor in, uh, in elections in America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are a variety of ways to do that, but I mean, you know, putting limits on how much you can spend is the way the most of the European countries approach the, the challenge. Yeah. Um, but we've got to consider, and I and I couldn't agree with you more. By the way, if we if we don't confront that challenge, then then the chances of a what I would call a pragmatic and level-headed progressive agenda diminish mm -hmm. when you get around to doing it because. But because the interests, you know, then are front and center. I mean, I, you just have to ask you sim a simple question. You know, could somebody get to, uh, elected to a, an important leadership position in the United States now uh, without a massive amount of financial backing from somewhere? Yeah. And I think the answer to that's no. Mm -hmm. I mean, I may be wrong, but it yeah. seems to be no. Yeah. So then the question is, where does that financial backing come from? And the answer used to be, you know, wealthy people in business. Now it's wealthy people in business and, you know, and other aggregated interests. Um, but also we now have this sort of Internet, you know, the small donation right. you know, channel. Right. And that's a that's a an arrival of some importance, probably, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because it's become big enough, you know, in the in a number of campaigns, Obama, I guess, was the pioneer yeah. or the, his mm -hmm. campaign in yeah. kind of raising money this way. Not yeah. that he didn't have the other kind as well. Um, and so we really I think we need the political scientists to sit down and say, well, kind of where are we? Yeah, in this perhaps the, and, uh, the Sanders and Elizabeth Warren uh, yeah. campaigns would be worth studying, not because they succeeded, but because they plowed in that pathway that you just were uh, uh, painting the picture of. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm, anyway, I'm with you on that. When people become despondent about the functioning mm -hmm. of government dominated by concentrated money, that despair fosters a submission to authoritarian or demagoguery like perhaps we just experienced in the United States over four years. And, yep. and that despair is not going to be alleviated. There's a static sense in which you can make a transfer and take a little bit of the sting out of the pandemic. But unless systemically that dominance of what I'll call plutocracy is curtailed, we'll, we'll revisit that despair over and over again. And I think that's, that's a very deep long-term danger that we have to confront right now for the kind of reasons you've shared. Yeah, and that's right. I mean, I, you know, in the end though, I think uh, at least in a, 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 dem a democracy, ultimately people, you know, have to look inward when they ask mm -hmm. that question. I mean, the, we have the system we've got because we haven't gotten rid of it and replaced it with something. And uh, so we can be despairing, but we can also realize that, you know, we have some agency if we kind of Mm -hmm. find young leaders that can take us there and then follow them mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and and get something done. So uh, I, I, guess, I guess all I'm really trying to say, Rob, is in addition to being kind of frustrated and despairing about aspects of the, the trends that we've been talking about, I think, I think you know, you're also seeing uh, in various parts of the political spectrum, you know, uh, Got a. This is our problem. <laughs> We're going to solve it. Sort of mm -hmm. attitude mm -hmm. and 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 activism of that type um, is ultimately what's required to make yeah. significant changes in direction. Well, I think a combination of even those who have the plutocratic advantage seeing a system as unsustainable, coupled with the activism, which reminds them of that, helps us yeah. evolve in a constructive direction. That's a really good point. You know, I mean, the engagement. No, look, I mean, we got to wait and see how it works out. But the, but the engagement, as, 
that we can see from the corporate and financial sectors now um, in taking some of the responsibility for dealing with the big challenges we face environmentally and in terms of uh, inequality, social cohesion, etc. cetera. Um, it's, it, at the very least, it's promising. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, let's, Mike, uh, you, you've mentioned in passing a couple of times what's happening in the developing countries. And before we talk about the difficulties in governance in the developed countries, we were talking about the role of technology and, and in the spirit of being constructive, what do you see as potentials related to technology and what do you see as the dangers related to this technology for the for the emerging countries? Well, I mean, they, I, we, you know, they, I, it's becoming common knowledge, but it but it, for a while it was kind of a closely guarded secret. So I think the simplest way to describe it is the, the most successful uh, development so growth slash development model. I use the word model in like, you know, strategy. Think of you know, for mm-hmm. most people, you'd think of strategy, but it is, but it's embedded in the strategy as a model of how the economy works, you know, when it's working well in a development context. And the most, the most successful and best known one is sometimes called the Asian development model. So we know basically that developing countries can grow at the rates we've seen six seven eight percent a year for long periods of time essentially because of the global economy Mm -hmm. what does that mean it means they sell something to the global economy in large amounts uh and they buy stuff from the global economy because they can't make everything they need including the things they need to sell the things they're selling to the global economy so it's an open economy model that leverages the, the enormous demand in the global economy. But what, that, what does that mean? It means p- relatively poor countries, even if they have a bill- billion citizens, don't have big enough economies to flood the global economy mm-hmm. in any sector, right? So if they specialize in doing something that they're pretty good at, they can sell it, you know, in enormous quantities. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's item one. And the item two in that, in that development model is you bring in technology that's been developed over you know, a couple of centuries, but not adopted here yet. And that's a much faster process than inventing the technology. So mm-hmm. there's mm-hmm. a good reason why we never saw growth rates at seven or 8% a year before the developing countries arrived on the, in the global economy after World War II. And those two things together, there's a lot of other moving parts in that model, and they're not of great interest to us right now. But the, but the, but the core point is that the, the area of comparative advantage, at least for countries that are not rich in natural resources, including agriculture, was labor-intensive manufacturing. Mm-hmm. That was, that's why it's called the Asian model, because that's where it's implemented in its most successful form. And the digital technologies, because of their particular characteristic, basically because of the speed with which they're moving. So the, the, the relevant digital technology is automation. There's been an enormous breakthrough in automation. Think of robots because of artificial intelligence with mm-hmm. data. They can learn to do things like C and with sensors. And so robots are basically growing like a weed, getting less and less expensive and can do more and more things. And if you ask the question, where are we now? The answer is we're at a point where robots, it depends on the sector you're talking about, you know, can do things that humans can do at lower cost and higher quality and greater reliability. Mm -hmm. Almost no matter what the what the cost of employing those human beings are. And because these the cost structures of digital technologies, as, as lots of people have noted, are high fixed, very low to negligible variable costs, as they as they as they get bigger, so to speak, as their the scope of the markets they enter gets larger and larger, the average costs keep going down and down and down. And that's not true of labor intensive technologies. I mean, mm-hmm. there's a bit of that because mm-hmm. there's learning curves. 
but it's not anywhere near as powerful. So once these digital technologies get to the point that they're scaled up, you know, to, to get the cost down so they're comparable and they're just gonna go past. And what that means is that, um, that uh, comparative advantage in labor intensive uh, process oriented manufacturing and assembly, which has been the kind of turbocharger of a lot of countries growth is, isn't gonna be as powerful. It won't happen overnight, uh, but they're basically, uh, we have a situation in which developing countries, if they're going to successfully grow at relatively rapid rates, they're going to have to engage with the global economy mm -hmm. in a different way. And it probably means in services. And that has all kinds of implications for, for what you do domestically, whether it's in education or infrastructure or whatever, um, that, that enables you to, to, to search for uh ways of connecting to the global economy i mean commercially productive ways to co connect to the global economy now, i don't think that's an insoluble problem but it's not a problem where you know that has the same status as the asian development model because by now everybody knows what that one is so that one's going away and another one's coming probably yeah. or hopefully and we don't really know what it is so that's the big challenge uh yeah. and but and and as an aside if you don't engage with the global economy uh, and you don't have that ability to sell into a big market and specialize, you can't grow fast. Mm -hmm. If you're selling to yourself, meaning to your own economy, um, then domestic demand is small and mm -hmm. relatively small in scope. So you don't, you, you really need the global economy, both dimensions, demand and technology to get this done. The flip side of that, and I don't want to be long winded, is there's starting to be studies that suggest that that another batch of digital technologies, those that support e-commerce platforms um, and fintech platforms, and especially when those platforms are uh, the center of an ecosystem, they're, the, the way the Chinese think of them is that the platforms, the architect of an mm -hmm. ecosystem. Mm -hmm. uh, and the ecosystem means just what it means in Silicon Valley and other places. It's a bunch of complementary resources that are easily available that that make it easy to innovate, start businesses, not have to do everything yourself because you can, you know, it's in the environment, accessible, and you can acquire it. Um, and those platforms, you know, have probably reasonably powerful growth um, promoting characteristics, but they have very powerful inclusion uh, characteristics. You know, so mobile payments, for example, is uh, is being used with the pile of data that it generates to do, to extend credit. I mean, these are algorithms, right? So there's machine learning applied to big piles of data and essentially make people who don't have any collateral, people or businesses that don't have any collateral and are, are anonymous, essentially, with respect to the traditional uh, banking system, um, you can extend credit to them on reasonable terms and make a profit and not have big loan losses and a whole lot of other things. And, and we're just on the start of that journey. So, so I can foresee a future in which these digital um, aspects of the digital technologies aren't really just a threat, but a, but a whole bunch of, uh, you know, as yet, not completely discovered opportunities because mm -hmm. um, I don't think the China experience is unique. I mean, it's true their infrastructure is better built out than a number of other places. But, you know, I'd be astonished if we don't see this, you know, with with real differences because of context, the same things in India and Indonesia. We already see it in, in, in Latin America. There's a big, rapidly growing e-commerce platform um, there that's also in mobile payments and so on. So I think, I think, and, and African countries themselves have innovated in mobile payment systems, given the, the technology and the infrastructure they've had available. So I think there's some promise there, whether it's big enough to have another golden age of, uh, of developing country growth, I think it's just too soon to tell. Well, another dimension of technology uh, relates to what I'll call information management communication uh, mm -hmm. with the 
large economies of scale, these platforms, these networks that we've learned about in movies like The Social Dilemma have what I'll call novel or interesting new characteristics. And yeah. the question of who becomes the arbiter of what's distributed. There is a sense in which fomenting critical discourse with multiple channels allows a democracy to make up its mind. Yeah. But, but if everything is funneled through one channel, we, we might call metaphorically the editorial director on that channel has a very powerful concentrated role in society. How do you imagine uh, shaping those systems and especially with the advertising model that was brought up in the social dilemma, where yeah. using the filter bubble, as uh, Eli Pariser labeled it, to reinforce people's priors, to increase their enthusiasm and their duration and their participation and their invitation to others to join the network creates more profit. But what it, in the parlance of the social dilemma, it may help foster a civil war by polarizing people in directions that That's true. make, make uh, it almost intractable to compromise. Yeah. Well, these are deep problems. So, you know, I guess, again, I, I, I like to try to break them down. You know, I, I remember data rights and security and all that. That is, you know, I mean, date, big databases are, are create, kind of co-created by the, by the owner of the platform and the users of the platform. Uh, most people, I think, are coming around to the view that it doesn't really make sense to try to decide who owns it. But it does make an awful lot of sense to decide, you know, rights, right? And the reason this is such an important, you know, in, uh, uh, issue is because this data is about people and it can be misused. So getting the trust mechanisms, legal structures, rights embodied in regulation and or law um, and security arrangements so that third parties, you know, who may or may not get access to the data either because it's sold to them or because they just steal it. Um, that's that. That's a set of issues. People are on top of it. Um, it's I think will come out in a reasonably sensible place at some point. You know, there's data on this now. There's studies. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, users actually learn over time who to trust. You know, what what data they're comfortable sort of you know coughing up and so on. They probably learn more about how it's used over time and so on so but that's one big i mean if we don't solve that let me put it in the negative if we don't solve that problem then a lot of the benefits that come from having big pools of data that are responsibly used to do productive and socially useful things like extend credit to you know low-income people like you know find good credits in people who are being excluded because you know on average it isn't a good risk or something like that um it's so I think it's important. Um, ironically, that's the easy one. <laughs> I mean, it's not easy at all, but it's easier than the other one. And the other one is content. Uh, so I don't think anybody has a real solution to this, but so let me tell you what I see. So the Chinese, you know, in fact, any, you know, any, any, um, governance system that, you know, seeks to sort of maintain order at all costs and understands how powerful the sort of communication channels are. I mean, Hannah Arendt wrote a book on fascism, you know, many, many years ago, and she basically said, and I'm not calling China fascist, by the way, it's, mm -hmm. she said, one of the most powerful tools in the, in the fascist toolkit is taking control of the media, right? so that the communication system is under their control. It's very hard to maintain a regime like that, you know, if somebody's out on the corner and uncontrolled sort of telling the truth mm -hmm. about what's going on. Uh, the Chinese approach is that, you know, with, you know, 
their own version of what is good for society, which includes stability uh, and, and not having internal wars and stuff, say basically the, the, in, the content of the, in these communication channels, let's call it the internet, okay, um, needs to be subject to, you know, controls. Uh, judgment has to be used. And that means somebody has to do that. And the, and the answer in China is the government, right? Or the party, whatever, however you want to describe it. So they, they don't mince words about it, right? There's not a, a lot of fussing around about free speech. It's not that they're against free speech, but they're against destructive free speech, and they get to decide what it is. So they don't really have a dilemma. Now, this may not, I mean, this may make a lot of people unhappy, and even relatively autocratic places don't go on forever if, you know, if the, uh, you know, social dialogue, you know, that goes along with society is, is suppressed beyond a certain point because mm -hmm. there's a pretty mm -hmm. universal value attached to that. Um, the rest of us really don't know what to do, as far as I can see, because we're caught um, in a balancing act that we don't want to acknowledge. And that balancing act is the value that we attach to individual rights, especially things like free speech, on the one hand, and the, and, and the value that we probably want to attach to um, social cohesion or, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. collective rights, if you like. Yes. Um, and when they're in conflict, we don't know what to do. And specifically in the Internet uh, and social media, where, which is the focus of the of attention. It doesn't make any sense to delegate, you know, content review to a private company, regardless of what their business model is. Right. And I mean, I think, you know, there are problems with a business model where you're selling people's data to advertisers. So I agree with that, but I don't think it's this problem. Um, this problem mm -hmm. is that, that there's nothing in the constitution or anything else uh, that says that they're the appropriate people to you know, do this. But since nobody else has stepped up to the plate, I mean, I'm overstating it a bit. They're basically caught in the crossfire and being asked to do it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And they're struggling with it, you know, so they have a panel of you know, wise people advising them, you know, so that they're not just kind of making it up in the office, you know, every day and so on. I mean, they're experimenting. And I think it's it's largely well intentioned because they they have it took some battering. But I think they now understand how powerful the impacts are on political and social discourse and how mm -hmm. how they can be very negative but let me skip to the bottom line at some point i think the government and you know has to step the government and the and the courts the legal system have to step up to this issue um and recognize that you know the answer isn't you know whichever platforms in vogue uh i mean what are we going to do so suppose tech TikTok eventually beats facebook then do we hand the ball off to TikTok? i mean it's just yeah. nonsense right yeah. uh these are big, important um, social decisions that we, we have to make. And we need the government, the legal system, and kind of everybody uh, involved in it. But they're going to be tough choices because they are going, as best I can tell, I, it, it, I don't see any way to sidestep this. Um, they're going to involve restrictions on free speech. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, and you can see universities battling this through now. I'm so glad I'm not, not an academic administrator anymore, you know, because because the same tension occurs. You know, at mm -hmm. what point um, does the university's commitment to open dialogue start to be have, net, you know, net negative benefits in terms of the cohesion of the community that they hope to foster? And mm -hmm. and once again, I mean, I, I pose that not because anybody did anything silly, but it's a really hard problem. The interesting, I, I guess, dilemma, using the word in another context, is that when you look at a place like Africa or Southern Asia, 
and describe the influence that digital technology will have, the question is, how do you teach the population? And who are the teachers, given the newness of this challenge? And right. at some level, if you said, we got to educate all the teachers to teach the younger generation to be ready for this challenge, I don't know if the teachers have assimilated the things that you're exploring. It's almost like science fiction. So the okay. question is, is there a role for what I will call uh, remote education? Things like courses that teach the teachers and teach the students, and then the teachers augment it with the interpersonal exploration that almost everything I see, by the way, about online education suggests that real human contact massively increases the participation and the duration of participation in online courses. If you have a well, teacher yeah. that you're answering to, if you have a mentor who's willing to discuss your confusions, that you might call your emotional stamina for staying with it, persevering, and getting the fruits of all the learning goes way up. So how do you yeah, see right. how, how do you see bringing this technology to the challenge of education, particularly in the emerging countries? Um, well, you know, I think of it, Rob, as a voyage of discovery. You know, so we've learned that the, these technologies complementing in-person education and at times filling in gaps, uh, mm -hmm. it, you know, it can be very useful. Um, but you're right. I mean, we don't and we'll learn more about this from a whole variety of experiments, people and studies, you know, that psychologists and educators will do. Um, so we'll we'll kind of, you know, not really stumble along, but you know we'll learn a lot as we go along that we you know to answers to questions that are a important and b we don't know how to answer them mm -hmm. um that said i think that the te the technologies are especially with a younger generation that kind of you know grows up using them some so somehow mm -hmm. um are pretty are potentially pretty powerful you know for the teachers as well as the as the students um there's unicorns now i mean this doesn't prove that point but there's unicorn more than it's unicorns in the education space mm -hmm. uh so these aren't little you know small experiments anymore they're going like gangbusters and to some extent they're filling in quality gaps in places like india um but you know so we're kind of finding our way but i think you know when the when the internet first when the World Wide Web became available, you know, I think we correctly thought that it was democratizing because it basically, with enough infrastructure that now seems to be being kind of built out globally, you, you basically have universal access to information, mm -hmm. right? Because it's all digitized and the cost of access, and it doesn't go away. And when A has it and it gets transferred to B, then they both have it. So it's what economists call non-rival. It's got all these powerful characteristics that Paul Romer and others have described. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that's a wonderful thing. I mean, you know, that is empowering. Uh, and I think in the education sphere, uh, as long as we don't slip up and, 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 and get to the point and I don't think it's going to happen where we think, gee, the digital technologies are a superior technology because they just aren't to in-person learning. Because be, I don't know how to describe it because it's not my field, but that you know, I, but I, but I see it in my own kids and others, and my grandchildren. You know, they just something goes on in a school when they're all there that doesn't go on. You know, when you're sitting in front of a screen, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. social, non-cognitive development. This, you know, motivation that comes from a particularly inspiring teacher. So, uh, you know, in 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 the in the best evolution going forward, you'll have everything. You know, you'll have inspiring teachers, personal contact, 
motivation, curiosity, all the things that educators talk about that aren't just being able to do math and logic and whatnot. Um, and then you'll have access to these resources. So, you know, INET's in this business. You, you know, you have Michael Sandel mm -hmm. and uh, Bill Janeway and, uh, yeah. and Robert others. Robert Skidelsky you know, doing, and, yeah, a lot of uh, Arjun Chang, all, of, all kinds of courses. Yeah. So you, you've got uh, a very rich menu of, thing, of, of, of offerings that are well produced, um, that are... That, can, that are resources that essentially available to the to the world as a, as as educational resources. I mean, I think you know, I think it's great. I mean, in a sense, we could have done this before, but it's easier now uh, that networks are faster. It isn't as clunky. Um, but we had to. We needed a kick in the pants. I mean, I'll give you an example. You know, I I've been away from Stanford physically for a long time, but then this spring. Dave Brady, who's there, and mm -hmm. I are going to conduct the experiment of, you know, having a course, which will be a hybrid. He'll be in the classroom and I'll be online. And at least some of the students will be in the room, we hope, what we don't know. <laughs> yeah. uh, but we wouldn't have even considered that, right? You know, I, I, including me, I just assumed that if I was on a different continent, my value as a, as a, as a educator to Stanford you know, it dropped essentially to zero and would stay that way until I was back in the neighborhood. Well, Mike, I, I want to say to you that when I have the pleasure of being on screen with you, I always think of my, my young scholars because you are such a model of humility and curiosity, an unyielding curiosity. When I try to point to them, as to who should, what you might call, inspire them to want to be an economist. You're one of the first people I think of. And today's well, really conversation kind. is a beautiful illustration of that. We've toured across all kinds of cutting edge domains, dilemmas, corruptions, uh, unknowns, and you yeah. you engage imaginatively, humbly, and with a what you might call a curiosity and imagination that illuminates and inspires hope. And I think there are a whole lot of leaders can learn a lot from your example and the young people too. So thanks so much for being well, my guest. It's a thrill to be with you. Thank you, Rob. Yeah. And thank you for I wish being... we had more answers though. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice thing to wish for. <laughs> and, yeah. But I, I love the fact that you're at the helm, along with Joe Stiglitz of the Commission on Global Economic Transformation, where we're trying to deal with all of the elements of disruption, globalization, migration, climate, technology, and uh, so many of these facets of, of the challenge, even the historic financialization and the ongoing ramifications. And uh, how would I say, in addition to your imagination, your spirit gives us leadership. So thank you. Thank you, Rob. It was great to be with you.